When women stop spending energy on being a perfect wife and a perfect mom and having a perfect house and having a perfect sex life, when they channel that energy into their family, their closest relationships, their teams, what we can create in this world gives me goosebumps. We have got to rechannel our time, energy, insanity into the things that light us up because you are here on purpose. Hey, I'm Brooke Jean, therapist, recovering perfectionist, and struggling working mom on a mission to normalize normal. If you're an overwhelmed, high achieving, and secretly anxious mama struggling to balance it all and on the brink of burnout, you are in the right place. Here is where we talk about hard things like balancing work and family life, mental health, and how to navigate life-altering transitions. Nothing is too taboo here. In my conversations, I'll teach you how to let go of who you think you're supposed to be in order to create the life you've always wanted. Get ready to embrace your messy, shed the shoulds, and find freedom through a life unperfected. This is the Unperfected Pod. Welcome back to the Unperfected Pod, where we normalize normal and find freedom through a life unperfected. What is up, Mama? Brooke Jean here. I'm your host. I'm so grateful to be here. I'm so grateful that you're here. And let's just go ahead and jump right in to today's topic. If you are listening to this podcast right when it releases, it's going to be on a Friday. And just last night, Thursday night, December 7th, I gave a talk on the content that I'm going to be sharing today. I created a workshop for those high achieving, high performing, often anxious, perfectionistic, busy working mamas called Three Ways to Unperfect Your Life so you can actually start living it. And before I get into those three ways and those three strategies that I'm so excited to teach you today, I think it's important to revisit my why. Why am I doing this work? Why have I created this podcast? Why have I rebranded to Brooke Jean Unperfected? Why did I create this training or workshop that I'm sharing and putting out into the world? And so I want to remind you guys that after I had my second child, my daughter, Chloe, who is now six, I got hit with some pretty intense postpartum, you name it, depression, anxiety, OCD. I just struggled mentally and emotionally. We didn't sleep for a very long time. I had to cut out dairy, soy, nuts, and eggs when I was nursing, and I had lost like 45 pounds, and I couldn't ever like cook the foods that I could eat because Chloe was really fussy and didn't want to be put in the swing or in the bouncer or in any of the things. And so it was a really hard time. And I had had my first baby 14 years earlier, and I had noticed just how much more intense the parenting pressure was in raising baby number one and in baby number two. And so I kind of took a big step back to get a wider perspective and a bird's eye view, if you will, of the overall phenomenon that I was identifying was taking place within these modern moms. And the phenomenon was this. When you look at the history of the role of mother, we have done nothing but take on more and more and more and more, right? We originally were in the homes, having the children, taking care of the children, making the foods, making the meals, doing all the things. Now we're working. Now we're also not just working, but we're actually out there making real money. We're real contenders in the business world. Many moms are the breadwinners of their household. When COVID hit, the moms were the ones managing the remote learning and the backs and forth, and we're still managing the kids' extracurriculars and their social activities, and we're still showing up in their classrooms and volunteering, and we're still cooking homemade meals. Now we're really being mindful of what we're feeding our kids and is it organic and dairy-free and all these things. And we're, you know, we're just doing more and more and more. And 
there's all this information coming at us from every possible place about how to do it better and different theories of parenting and different theories of eating and nutrition and different theories of behavior management and all this. And then you compile that with social media where everyone is blasting their best moments, right? Myself included. I'm guilty of it too. And so this modern mom is just doing more and more and more, and the pressure is higher, and the access to endless information is more than ever and more confusing than ever. And then we have all these social media images showing all these moms just killing it, doing it right, enjoying it, looking amazing. And so many of us are going, what is wrong with me? I don't have the energy to do that. I don't look like that. I don't have that relationship. I don't have that marriage. I don't have that body. I don't have that patience. I don't have that next level in my business. What is wrong with me? And so this rise in the pressure and the expectation on modern mom parallels a rise in our mental health conditions. So at the same time as we are doing the most, we are also more depressed, more anxious, more PTSD, more drinking, more spending, more eating, more numbing, more raging, like all of these coping mechanisms that we're engaging in, in silence and in shame, because those are not the things that we blast on social media. And so this expectation it, from where I'm standing and in my personal and professional opinion has made us unwell. It's making us sick. And so something has got to give. And so that's where I became really passionate about working with moms and helping us lower the bar and helping us heal and helping us get clear on what matters most. And so where it all began was in my own struggle and in my own journey and my own observation. But then I was like, wait, why are we doing all these things? Why are we trying to achieve perfection? And it comes back to conditioning, right? Conditioning is something that I teach on the second episode of this show, which conditioning is basically as little human beings from zero to six or seven, we are the most impressionable. And we have a ton of stimuli coming at us, a bunch of information about what it means to be a human walking this earth and what it means to be a good girl and to have good behavior and to be well liked and to be validated and be safe and to be loved. And we start to see on media what a woman looks like and what a mother looks like. And we see through the women that we are in circles with, how they're interacting and how they're treated and what their roles are. And so all of this information that's coming through our receptors into our subconscious and consciousness, we boil down to these core beliefs about what a girl's role is, what a mother's role is, what a good enough mom is, what a good enough girl is. And those core beliefs really flavor the way that we perceive the world and ourselves in that world. Okay. And so I want to walk you through a little exercise right here and now to illustrate this point around conditioning. So if you're not driving, I want you to take a pause here. Take a deep breath because you probably need that anyways, right? Take a deep breath and close your eyes for just a second. And I want you to conjure up an image of what a good mom is. So go ahead and take a moment and do that right now. Conjure up an image. What is the image you have in your mind of what a good mom is? Okay. You may have an image of your own mother or your own grandmother, and she may be kind and she might be nurturing and she might be in the kitchen and she might be wearing an apron and she might be, you know, tending to everybody's needs and showing up for all of your things. Or maybe she is in the working profession and she's finding herself or Maybe she's not speaking her mind and not getting her needs met and she's passive aggressive or maybe maybe she's, okay, that wouldn't be an image of a good mother. That would just be an image of a mother that you experienced. But my point in this exercise is when you think of the image of a good mom, what comes to your mind? There are some characteristics here, right? 
like a good mother is just like always giving of herself and just like makes the best food and just like knows the right thing to do and say and shows up for all the things and is like well loved by her community and gives back and like has the most thoughtful gifts and like knows how to wrap presents, right? Like this is the stuff that I had like in my mind, like what a good mother consists of. And so what came up in your mind is going to be different than what came up in my mind because of this phenomenon called conditioning, okay? Growing up, you learned what it meant to be a good girl, a good wife, a good mom. And over time, we've just been learning more and more and more through, again, the influx of information online and social media, what it means to be a good mom. So we have this ideal image that like, I think the key that is pretty consistent for so many of us is a good mom can do it all, right? She can do the marriage. She's got the house under control. She can go to work. She's killing it at work. She's like fun with the kids. She gets them to all their things. She's on top of the school emails. Like in our minds, moms can do it all. Mom is superhero. And so we are busy subconsciously trying to achieve that just trying to do good in the world, just trying to take care of things, just trying to meet that standard that was placed upon us that we, by the way, participate in perpetuating, right? And so when we think about how do we unperfect our lives so we can actually start living it, we first have to acknowledge that we're trying to do it all and that perhaps that's not working for us, right? Perhaps that's not lending itself to us feeling whole, healthy, well, at ease, happy, whatever it is. It's not working for us. So we have to agree that something's got to give. We cannot continue to just do more and more and more And then feel all these emotions around resentment and overwhelm and burnout and illness, right? And so what is tip number one? Tip number one to beginning to unperfect your life so you can actually start living it is to identify your core beliefs that are keeping you in this hamster wheel of doing more and more and more, okay? How do we do that? How do we identify what those core beliefs are that are driving our thoughts, feelings, and behavior? We follow our shoulds. Okay, so anytime you're telling yourself, I should do this, I should go in early, I should stay late, I should volunteer, I should go to that party, I should be cooking five meals a week, I should be having sex with my partner five times a week, whatever it is, that should and supposed to that you also know there's a little bit of internal resistance to. Like, I should volunteer for this thing, but I don't really want to. I should go to this holiday party, but I'm exhausted. I should cook five meals and we should be eating family as a dinner, but that doesn't feel even doable or realistic with sports and extracurriculars and energy levels, right? So follow your shoulds because if I'm feeling like I should cook five meals a week and we should be having dinner as a family at a table and having meaningful discussion, I'm going to get curious about that should and go, wait a minute, I'm shoulding on myself. I'm telling myself that I should be making all of these meals and having all of this quality time over dinner. Where does that come from? Where does that come from? And is it really true that I have to do that, that we have to do that? Does that actually make the most sense for me and my family and what we've got going on? Do I really value that? Okay, so maybe you're saying, I should join the PTO. Listen, we need people to do this job. And thank you. If you are one of those moms who does, respect to you. But do you, what, what is driving that? I have to do this. I should do this. I'm supposed to. Is it because your mom did? Is it because that's what good moms do? Is it because, you know, what is the reason? And is it really core to who you are? 
and what makes you happy and what lights you up and what's important to you. Now, the key here is that there is no right or wrong. So you can be a mama that is passionate about nutrition and making healthy meals and sitting down and having dinner together. That's a beautiful thing. Rock on, sister. Or you might just thrive on the PTO. Good for you. Do the things that light you up. But if it's something that you're doing because you think you're supposed to, but it doesn't, it actually creates burnout, overwhelm, and resentment, then we might need to like renegotiate that deal. So look at where you're shooting yourself and unpack it. I feel like I'm supposed to go to this birthday party this weekend. Why? Seriously, though, why? We have got to stop overscheduling ourselves. Part of the reason why we're overwhelmed and overstimulated and just walking around with a dysregulated nervous system is because we don't know the power of saying no. We say yes to everything. You do not need to go to every holiday party. You do not need to go to every single, you know, game and practice and performance and all the things. Pick the things that you're most passionate about. Okay? And so then once you start to identify, wow, I have some beliefs that like good moms volunteer at the school, good moms volunteer on the PTO, good moms make healthy homemade meals five times a week, good moms, you know, have this many date nights and this type of relationship. Is that belief relevant, realistic, and supportive of your context today? as a modern mom. If it's not, we need to give it an upgrade. And how do we give these core beliefs an upgrade? Subconscious reprogramming, aka neuroplasticity. We now know that our brains are malleable, meaning they are constantly growing, changing, pruning, and evolving. So these core beliefs like good moms work out and are fit, That's been driving your thoughts, feelings, and behaviors. And you've done that for so long that you've actually created like neural pathways around it in your mind, habits in your brain, muscle memory in your body. And we've been doing that for so long. But just like we had built that pattern, that habit, that norm, that neural pathway, we can override it and build a new one. Okay. So maybe you've been burning yourself out because you believe that as a good mom, you want to be able to take your kids to school and pick them up, but you're running a business. And so you find yourself working until midnight every night and you're exhausted. You are exhausted because your belief is good moms should be able to do it all. Is that realistic, relevant, and supportive of today's context of the modern mom? F to the no. F to the no. That is not sustainable. You are not losing your mind that you are struggling with that. We were not designed to work that hard. Do you guys know, this is rando, but did you know that we only have four hours of like our good cognitive fuel a day? And that tracks for me because I got about four hours of juice and then honey, I start nose diving, nose diving. So where did we get this eight, nine, 10 hour work day? No, nope. That's actually not. As humans, we're animals. We were not designed to hustle and grind. We were designed to hunt and then rest, hunt and then rest, kill it and then chill, kill it and then chill. But we're not as good at the chill because of conditioning and the pressures society places on us. And then our own desire to be validated and well-loved and well-liked are people-pleasing and perfectionistic. It's just a recipe for disaster, right? And so this belief that uh, like good moms can do it all needs an upgrade. But good moms can do it all. If that's your belief, it has determined what you're looking at in the world. It has determined the thoughts that you're having. Those thoughts release hormones, which we label feelings in our body. So let me kind of walk you through the neurobiology of this. You have the belief that good moms can do it all. That belief is flavoring your perception of yourself, your life, the world. That belief has you looking 
for reasons why you are able to do it all or you're falling short. We also have something in our brains called negativity bias. So you're more likely to be noticing where you're falling short, where you're problematic, where you're not enough. And then, of course, when you're comparing yourself to everyone else, it looks like you're not doing enough. It looks like you're not doing the most. Everybody else looks like they're doing more and doing it well and so happy and grateful for it, right? And so those thoughts are releasing hormones like cortisol and adrenaline, which then we label emotions in our body, okay? Like that might be why you're experiencing anxiety or anger or rage or sadness or overwhelm or resentment or contentment, whatever those things are, right? And so these core beliefs, it's really important that we get clear on what they are because they're driving the bus of your life. And they're either helping you feel good and do good in the world, or they're helping you feel bad, which makes it really hard to do good in the world, right? So when we can follow our shoulds, Get to that core belief about what it is a good mom does. Put it on the table and examine it. Is this belief serving me? Yes or no. Is this belief relevant, realistic, and supportive to my context? Yes or no. And then now is where we get to choose a new one. The power of choice. It's magnificent, my loves. We get to choose a new belief. So what would a healthier belief be? For me, it's not good moms do it all. It's a good mom is intentional with her time, energy, and sanity. And I don't even say a good mom anymore. It's just I choose to live with intentionality. That's my new belief. Intention is key. That's my new belief. Intention is key. I do also have a belief that good moms take care of themselves first. Good moms take care of themselves. I also have a new belief that I deserve to feel good because for a long time, I didn't think that I did. For a long time, I was self-sabotaging and punishing myself for some trauma or whatever the fuck, right? But now I've done the reprogramming work and my brain has real thoughts and real beliefs around these things. And when you have a belief that intention is key and that starts to flavor your perception of the world and that starts to determine the thoughts and the way that you see things and that starts to release different hormones in your brain and body that feel like different feelings, it's easier to take aligned action and get where you want to go and create a life that you're proud of, that you don't need to numb out from, that you don't need to run away from, right? And so here's how you do that reprogramming work. There's a lot of different ways to do that reprogramming work. But the one that I'm teaching in this workshop is you write out your old belief, which, you know, whatever it is, good moms do it all. Then you write out your new belief. Intention is key. Moms deserve to feel good. Mom, you know, fills her tank first. Moms can have a social life. Moms can be career driven. Moms should follow what lights them up. What is your new belief? Write it down. Write it down in a journal, in a planner, on a sticky note, and somewhere that you're going to see it every day. Because you're going to start to tell yourself that over and over and over again until it sinks into your subconscious mind and you believe it. And when you start to feel overwhelmed, resentful, You're going to get curious. You're going to use mindfulness to get curious and go, wow, what is driving me to keep doing the things that are making me feel this way? Oh, there's that belief again that good moms can do it all. And in that moment, you're going to say, but that's not true for me anymore. Intention is key. So it's like you're going to catch yourself when you're in the moment in that belief system and you're going to reframe and you're going to overwrite that old belief with emotional intensity and repetition until you have created new neural networks around that new belief. You're also going to work passively to influence your subconscious mind by writing it somewhere that you see it. You want to take it a step further in your journal each day, write out your new belief 
and write out what action you're taking that's in alignment with that belief. So if my new belief is that I deserve to feel good, you guys can also go back to my journaling episode because I shared my journaling technique, which has like a mixture of like processing things, but also manifestation and just making sure that I'm in flow and in alignment and taking steps toward the life that I'm creating and the way that I want to feel and the person that I want to be. So if my new belief is I deserve to feel good, I'm writing in my journal the shit that I'm doing today to help myself feel good. Well, I'm going to do my morning ritual. I'm going to have my hot lemon water. I'm going to do my meditation. I'm doing my journal. I'm going to go on a walk today. I'm going to do a yoga nidra today. I'm going to have a nutritious lunch today. I'm going to have some friend time tonight for a happy hour. I'm going to be reading this book that I love. I'm going to have some quality time with my partner. I'm going to be having some quality time with my kids. What are you doing today to take action to make that belief come to life and do it, baby? This is one way that we reprogram these subconscious beliefs. Because when we have beliefs that we are enough and we're doing enough and that intention is key and that we deserve to feel good, can you imagine the world that we can create? We can lower the bar collectively. We can take a deep ujjayi breath. And we can feel more at ease in our bodies. So that was tip number one. Follow your shoulds so you can start to identify the beliefs that are driving your perfectionism and reprogram those bad boys. Tip number two, claim your space, honey. Claim it. Claim your space. What does that mean? That means that we need to protect our precious jewels. And you already know, you already know how I feel about these precious jewels that I've identified. What are they? Time, energy, and sanity. Those are your precious jewels, mama. They are your finite resources that are extraordinarily valuable that you have just been given away subconsciously, which is why you're burnt out. You have got to protect your time. You have got to protect your energy and you've got to protect your sanity. And I'm going to give you some techniques on how to do that. Okay. Claiming space looks like if I rid myself of the burden of perfectionism, If I rid myself of the energy I've been putting into having the perfect marriage and the perfect body and the perfect parenting and the perfect meal and the perfect holiday, I have now created space in my mind, body, and spirit for the shit that actually matters most to me. So you see, we can't just add more to our calendars. We need to first shed those shoulds to unburden ourselves of those pressures to create the space for the things that matter most. And we need to claim it. No one's coming to give it to us. We have to take the action. You have more control over your time than you're giving yourself credit for. So let's unpack these three parts of claiming yo space. You're you're protecting your precious jewels, time, energy, and sanity. So let's start with time. Okay. I took Marie Forleo's Becoming a Time Genius training. It was phenomenal. I got this exercise from her in that training. So I want to give respect where respect is due. You're going to get out a sheet of paper and you're going to brain dump all the things that you're doing in a week. And I mean all of it. I mean packing lunches. I mean meal planning, going to the store, taking the kids to school, things that you're doing for work, how you're staying up on the school emails, how you're staying up on homework, how you're staying up on extracurriculars, how you're staying up on your social life, their social lives, date nights, who's ordering the cleats, who's registering for the next season, like write out everything that you're doing. This exercise in and of itself is therapeutic. It gets this floating, never-ending to-do list that's just been, you know, floating around in your emotional brain. When you write things down, it moves that data to your prefrontal cortex, your rational executive functioning part of your brain. So it's validating when you write all this out and you see how much you're doing. You go, wow, I'm doing a lot. Of course I'm feeling overwhelmed. Look at what I'm doing. I don't care if it takes you two days to write it down or four sheets of paper. I know you're doing a lot, my love. Write out everything you're doing. And now I want to teach you about Plato's principle, the 80-20 rule, which states that 80% of our results come from 20% of our effort. 80% of your outcomes and results are driven from 20% of your effort. 
which means we really need to be working on the right things 20% of the time to get almost all the way there. But we need to get really crystal clear on what that 20% is. So I want you to think about what is the life that I want to be creating? What is it that I want in my life? How is it that I want to feel? Am I prioritizing the things that are actually helping me get there? So when you, there's a couple things you can do. You can look at your core values. I recommend the Life Compass cards. You can get them on Amazon. It's a card system and game where you can identify your core values. And you could let those be the guiding principles. Or you can just look at, you know, what are your dreams? What are your actual goals? What is it that you're trying to create, right? So maybe in your family, you're trying to create more quality time. And maybe in your business, you're trying to hit six figures. What are the things that actually make that happen? Okay. So quality time with your family is going to look like scheduling it. It's going to look like planning it. It's going to look like protecting it. It's going to look like communicating it. We need to prioritize those things. Hitting six figures in your business is going to look like, what are you doing to sell? Are you creating offers? Are you marketing them right? Are you selling them? Are you in front of people? Are you embodying the brand? Are you clear on your brand? Okay. I don't care how busy you are doing busy work, like responding to emails and doing all the things that aren't moving the needle forward. That's not a good use of your precious jewel time. So I want you to look at that long list and I want you to remember what is the thing that you want in your life. And I want you to highlight the 20% of that long list that you know is the priority to help you get where you want to go. I call those the big potatoes, right? So for me, it's going to be actually spending time with my family. For me, it's going to be actually, you know, being in front of people, embodying the brand, talking about what we do and making connections and being in the energy with people so people know what it's like to work with us because that's how we get clients. And then working with my clients because we get a ton of referral business because once you're working with us, you know the scoop, you know what you're getting, right? I can really burden myself with a bunch of nonsense all day, every day, and really burn out and feel like I'm the busiest bee in the world. But if it's not getting people in the door, if it's not driving sales, that is not a big potato. And by the way, no shame in this game. Human nature is to choose the easy stuff. Human nature is to go for the low-hanging fruit. Human nature is to avoid making that sales pitch and that hard call, that difficult conversation, hiring a new person, firing somebody, having that hard conversation with your partner, having a hard money conversation so you can start budgeting for that quality time that you want. Like it's human nature to avoid the hard thing. But if you want to live with intention, you need to show up fully and be in your courage and focus on what matters and leave the rest. Because this is what Marie Forleo taught me, and I believe it. I was resistant in the beginning. There's always time for what matters most. Let me repeat that, because this one was hard for me to digest. It took a minute. There is always time for what matters most. The key is not everything matters. You've just been taught that it should, right? Not everything matters. It doesn't need to. I can love quality time with my kids, but not like, you know, sitting on the floor and playing. I can love going on adventures, but not love cooking. Like there is no right or wrong. We just need to get clear on what matters most. So you've made a list of all the things you do. You've identified your top 20%, your big potatoes. Now I want you to pull out your calendar or your planner, and I want you to make sure that you have plotted that 20%. Put the things that matter most on your calendar first, and your self-care better be on there, sweetie. Your self-care, whether it's your morning rituals or your workout routine or your meditation practice or your yoga practice or your connecting with like-minded women or your daily walks or your naps or your time to make a healthy lunch, the things that make you happy, that keep you feeling like yourself and healthy and whole, that should be one. 
That should be in the 20%. Plot the 20%. Plot the big potatoes on your calendar right now and protect that shit fiercely, baby. Fiercely. And then you can look at the other 80% of your list and you can prioritize it. You can look at where you can outsource it. You can look at who else can be doing this for me. Can I ask my partner? Can I ask my nanny? Can I ask carpool? Can I ask a friend? Can I just stop doing it all together? Right? Yes, yes, and yes. So that's one of the techniques that I can teach you around protecting your time is getting really clear of like, where am I spending my time? And is it on the things that kick the ball down the field toward where my vision is for my life? Or am I just a busy body, just responding to everybody's needs and then, you know, feeling burnt out? You determine where your time and energy goes. But you're going to have to set some boundaries and you're going to need to call on your courage and your leadership to A, do this work, do this exercise, make these decisions, communicate them, and hold that boundary up. Because again, there's always time for what matters most. So let's get into precious jewel number two, which is energy. Again, our precious jewels, time, energy, and sanity. These are the things that we're going to be mindful of to claim space now that we've unburdened ourselves and shed the shoulds. So when it comes to energy, again, we are not an unlimited tank of gas. So I want you to imagine that you are a battery and you need to charge yourself overnight with really good sleep. And you need to, the first thing you do when you wake up in the morning is get that extra charge. You want to plug into yourself, pour into yourself. So this is why, this is where I remind you that how you start the day sets the tone for your day. So this is why I love a good morning ritual of coming downstairs and having my hot lemon water and my meditation and my journal and my music before I even look at my email, before I look at social media, before I look at the news, before I do anything. Because that sets off an entire slew of positive, A, biochemicals in my brain and body and then behaviors that I do, that I engage in, actions that I take in response to those biochemicals. And then energetically, I can start really in alignment. I can start really intentional. I can be in my body. I can be in my essence. So how you start the day sets the tone for your day. What's your morning ritual? If you are getting up and you first thing you're doing is looking at your phone and looking at all the terror in the world, you are getting an immediate cortisol shot and it is going to be hard to recover from that for the rest of your day. This is what it looks like to live with intention. You choose not to look at your phone. You choose to go downstairs and do something that pours into you, that charges your battery. Then we need charging stations throughout the day because, again, we've got four hours of cognitive fuel. First of all, it can feel like you've just run a damn marathon just getting your child to wherever they go, whether it's the nannies or preschool or daycare or school. Just the morning routine and getting them off, you can be like, I feel like it's lunchtime and it's 8 a.m. Then you jump into whatever you're jumping into, right? If it's work or whatever. And are you stopping throughout your day to walk away from your computer, to go outside, to get some nourishment, to face the sun, to drink the water, to move your body, to listen to music, to do these things that charge our battery, right? Whether that's a good lunch or a walk or a yoga nidra or just a break and going outside and earthing for a little bit. We need charging stations to fill back up, right? So what are your habits? What are your routines? What are your rituals? What are your practices to take care of yourself. First, you have to be aware of what's going on. Second, you have to take aligned action. These little practices have helped me significantly in my life. I stand so strongly behind them. They will change your life. Little baby actions over time creates marginal gains, creates big shifts in your life. And think about the message you're telling yourself when you show up for yourself in this way. 
When you say, I'm going to be protective of my energy and I'm going to start my day in this beautiful way, I'm going to check in throughout the day, I'm going to hit my charging stations. When you take that action, your brain and body is recording that information as truth that you freaking matter. And then energetically, that is a high self-worth frequency. There is so much good in you choosing to engage in these little habits and rituals throughout the day. So create your charging stations, have your little mini pauses, pour into yourself throughout the day. And you may notice that you actually have some like willpower in the evening to get through dinner and to get through the evening routine without taking a sledgehammer to your mental health and, you know, drinking a bottle of wine and numbing out and doing all the things that I used to do because I never was awake. I wasn't living consciously. I also want to talk to you about the peak energy zone. So just begin to notice when you have your best energy and put your like most important thing from that top 20% in that spot. So for me, it's like from 7 to 10 a.m. is my best energy. So I need to be creating during that time, right? When is your best energy? When is your peak energy? And just making sure that you're using that strategically with your scheduling and your planning. So that's just one little tip or a couple little things to think about in protecting your energy. The final one is sanity. Who feels like they're lost their marbles? Sanity is really about stress management in this context. And this is where I remind people that there's a difference between stressors and your physiological stress response in your body. So we have millions of receptors and there is just a billion stimuli coming in through your receptors all day long that then your body is reacting to. And if it's threatening in any kind of way, if it's putting your body in a danger response in any kind of way, you are releasing cortisol, you are in a stress response. Now, it's not on its own terrible to have a stress response. We want to be able to identify threats and find dan- not find danger, but respond to danger with cortisol and adrenaline, because it's going to be the way that we protect ourselves. It's going to be the way that we get through that. But what's happening is we're in, as a society, an overproduction of this cortisol and adrenaline. And so we've got this physiological stress response in our body. And the issue is us not, what's the word I'm looking for? I was going to say dismissing it, (laughs) but that's not it. Discharging it is the word I'm looking for. And so one of the things that we need to do is be mindful of our stress response and to close our stress cycle daily so we can manage our sanity. How many of you out there have really beautiful practices of walking every day or working out? And when you don't, how do you feel? How do you feel like a pressure cooker about to blow off? Because you have not discharged the emotion in your body, the stress in your body, the hormonal surplus in your body. So what is the most efficient way to complete your stress cycle each day? Just 20 minutes of movement, baby. It can be a brisk walk. A 20-minute brisk walk a day will discharge your physiological stress response. There's an incredible book. It's called Burnout that kind of breaks down the science of this and so much more if you want to learn more about it. Okay, but all emotion wants to be in motion. And one of the reasons why we lose our marbles is because we have all of this emotional response in our body and we have nowhere to go with it. And then, of course, as girls, as good girls, quote unquote, we've been taught to like not show anger and not show rage and not be loud and not be intense and not be intimidating. So so many of us tend to just stuff all those feelings until they come out in one way or another right? And so part of maintaining your sanity is moving the physiological emotion out of your body, okay? Some other ways to close and complete your stress cycle every day are crying. Crying releases cortisol, meditation, breath work, sleep, positive social interaction, affection, but specifically the 20-second hug and the six-second kiss, creative expression, Body work like massage, acupuncture, energy healing, sound healing. And I just want to remind you that the one thing that doesn't work is gaslighting yourself and minimizing it and pretending like you're okay. Okay? That's the thing that doesn't work. So I want you to think about right now, 
what is a small commitment that you can make to claiming your space? So whether it is a time strategy or an energy strategy or a sanity strategy, what is one thing that you can pull from what I just shared with you that you can write down, plan it, schedule it in, and start to do and show up? And I want you to notice how you feel about that today, and then I want you to track how you feel about it in 30 days once you've really committed to a new practice. But just to kind of summarize up to this point, the first thing that we did, tip one, was follow your shoulds so we can shed the shoulds, so we can unburden ourselves of the pressure of perfectionism. Because when we unburden all of that, we make space for what matters most. We claim that space for the things that matter most. And then we protect our precious jewels, time, energy, and sanity. And I just gave you a technique in each and every one of those buckets to be able to do that. So which thing is resonating with you? Which thing are you like, yes, I need that, Brooke. I need to try that on. Write it down and commit to it for 30 days. It's what you do in between these calls that actually moves the needle forward. That's where the magic is. You can learn information all day long, but if you don't move it from information into integration, if you don't actually apply the practices, you're not going to get the result. You have to do the work and apply the practices and you have to do it with consistency for at least 30 days to really experience the benefit. But here's the good news. Once you experience the benefit, baby, you have this intrinsic motivation to continue. So just choose one thing. That's important too. It's like, don't try to do all the things, honey. Don't try to do all the things. If you try to do all the things, your brain is going to go into overload. It's going to say, there's no way that I can do that. And it's going to shut you down and you're going to feel stuck and frozen. So we choose one thing that we're excited to play with, that we're excited to experiment with, and we commit to that bad boy fiercely. And if we're struggling to continue on, on with the commitment, we look at that with curiosity and compassion. Why is it so hard for me to do what I said I was going to do? I made a commitment to myself that I wasn't going to get on my phone in the morning and that I was going to start my day with meditation. Why am I struggling to make that happen? Is there a belief that's fueling my struggle? Is there a boundary that I need to set? Right? What is getting in your way? And the last tip is to normalize freaking normal. Okay? The third tip to unperfecting your life is to just recognize that nobody is killing it, okay? I know it might look like they are, but every mom has a very messy mama struggle right now. Every family has dysfunction. Every household has some shit they don't want anybody in the neighborhood to know, okay? Everybody has a struggle. To walk this earth is to face yourself and the hardest things. And so the more that you can connect with other moms in community and share the real stories of what is going on, the healthier you are going to be. It's not about just complaining about this motherhood gig and staying in the energy of complaints. It's about, hey, when I say that I'm struggling with depression, that normalizes that experience for other mothers who then might feel safe to say that they're struggling too. And when we normalize this wide range of the normal human experience, we remove the shame, which helps people take action to help themselves. I am more likely to get the help that I need to make the decisions I need to make in my life when I can say out loud, I have this struggle than if I'm suffering in silence and in my secrets, right? So this is where I'm going to encourage you to join a community of real moms who keep it real, who say it like it is, who make you feel safe to say what's really up, who do not judge you that you forgot that it was field day today or that you ate McDonald's three times this week or that you drank a whole bottle of wine last night. Like we need safe places to share our messy mama moments so we can be in community we can remove the shame and we can problem solve together. We can support each other. And what's going to be so exciting about me doing this talk on Thursday is that is exactly what's happening, right? I'm doing the talk at this place called The Den in Denver, and it's basically like a beautiful co-working coffee shop for moms and dads and their babies. And there's like 
playroom and a nursing room and a conference room and it's beautiful and there's something for everyone and we're going to come together and we're going to get together and we're going to dance and we're going to meditate and we're going to learn these principles of unperfecting and we're going to connect and we're going to commiserate and we're going to laugh and like that's what it's about. Don't suffer in silence. Where are your mamas? Find them. Just being here on the podcast is part of a community that we're building. Join the Mommy's Mental Health Matters, okay? We're going to launch a membership in January. Join our membership. Be in community with us. Because it's not just about normalizing normal. It's about what we can do after that because we've unburdened ourselves further. We've unburdened ourselves with the shame, okay? And so here's where in the actual workshop, we're going to do a little circle time. And we're going to share our messy mama moments. What's the thing that you're really struggling with right now? And you know what's going to be so powerful is sitting in a circle and listening to each other and holding space and saying, I see you, mama, and I've had that same struggle and I get it. And here's what I did and I'm on the other side. So may I give you hope and may I give you a resource or may I just be in the presence with you and may I give you a hug and the fact that we get to all share and be seen, it's going to make you feel like you're not a freaking failure. You're actually doing all right. Because think about what's possible when we come from an energetic and a belief that it's all right. We're doing okay. We're good enough. We're not a failure. What's possible is new outcomes. What's possible is feeling better, therefore doing better. And so as I close, I want to summarize the power of unperfecting. What is possible for us when we shed our shoulds, when we claim space, and when we normalize normal? We free up time, energy, and sanity for the things that matter most to us. We heal. We get reconnected with our authenticity. And then we go out into the world and we relate and we collaborate and we create from this authentic essence. And when I imagine what's possible, when women stop spending energy on being a perfect wife and a perfect mom and having a perfect house and having a perfect sex life and having a perfect body and having a perfect wardrobe, and they channel that energy into their family, their closest relationships, the solutions to complex problems, their teams, their offer, their service. What we can create in this world gives me goosebumps. We have got to re-channel our time, energy, insanity into the things that light us up because you are here on purpose. But you've just been really busy focusing on the wrong things because the world told you you were supposed to. And it's gotten really confusing. And it's really worn you out. And I understand that struggle more than you will ever know. But now we get to choose to do different and to be different. And when we do, when we unperfect our lives, We give our sisters permission to. We teach our daughters and our sons something different. We teach them that we are human beings and we came here for a purpose and we are allowed to have dreams and desires and interests and passions that are authentically unique to us. And when we live in alignment, we do really, really good in the world and we feel more alive and we feel more content and we feel more at ease and we're healthier and whole. I don't know about you. But that's the new modern mom. That's the new context that I want to live in. Because when I'm intentional, when I choose to invest in a few things versus the thousands upon thousands that the world tells me is important, I can make a greater impact. I can be a better mom. I can be a better person. I can be a better therapist and coach and consultant. I can help more people in the world. I can live with more ease. And now have I arrived, honey? You know I haven't. She's a work in progress and always will be. But I'll tell you how much better life has gotten when I stopped doing what the world told me I was supposed to do and started getting really clear on what actually mattered most. The world opened up. And that is also my hope for you, my love. So that concludes 
my message for today that concludes the training and the workshop that I'm going to walk mamas through. Well, if you're listening to this, it already happened. Make sure that you're on my email list or you're following on Instagram at Brooke Jean Unperfected to hear about when the next Unperfected Mama meetup is going to be and what the next workshop is going to be because I'm going to keep getting women together in circle to share what's really up because it's healing and it's powerful. And I hope that you found one little nugget from this talk that you really truly wrote down and are going to put into practice because all I want is for this to serve you in meaningful and impactful ways. Take care of yourselves and therefore each other. And I will see you all same time, same place next week. Bye for now. Thank you so much for listening to the Unperfected Pod. I hope this episode helped you feel a little less alone and a little more inspired to be you. If you like what we're doing here, I would so appreciate that you subscribe, rate, and review this podcast. If you do, share the episode on Instagram and tag me at Brooke Jean Unperfected to enter to win a one-to-one laser coaching session. Also, feel free to join me in my private Facebook community, Mommy's Mental Health Matters, where we continue the conversation. Thanks again for being here and see you in next week's episode.